Welcome to Lola and the Poets, a podcast on the magical reel. Welcome, dear people, to Lola and the Poets, a podcast on the magical reel, traveling with the speed of sound directly to your amygdalas from the leafy Danube groves of Novi Sad, Serbia. This is the fifth show in the series and the second solo one in which I talk about the concept of the shadow, both individual and collective. My name is Milana and I will be your host. Hundreds of thousands of people are going to listen to him over the radio. And unless he says something that's, well, that's sensational, it's just no good. The biggest thank you to all who are still interested in this podcast. Uh, last year, it was um, starting really brightly, but managed to reach only four episodes until 2020 finally caught up with me like it did to us all. Although maybe it's not a fundamentally bad thing to take time to develop a project uh, in its own pace, understand its rhythm, rhyme and reason, and refine its essence. So Lola and the Poets is now on Spotify, YouTube, and on its own host site, my blog, Poets, Mavericks and Profits. All places where it will hopefully stay, uh, come hell of high water or something else, we don't know. Anyway... Um, this is all very much what the gist of this particular episode is about, uh, namely um, the uh, proverbial Fifty Shades of Our Dark Collective Brain, the sinisterly seductive and incredibly addictive chiaroscuro of social media, a new sort of shadow patterning of communications, a bit of uh, media leather and lace, if you will. Last show was last July, and I had a great chat with Divya Mkhaya Bernstein, a most magical artist and storyteller from London. We talked about childhood philosophies, uh, mystical Ireland, origins and practices of storytelling, a magical atmosphere, the potency of enhanced reality, inner critics, inner worlds, trusting your own creative powers, importance of vibes and tribes, art as ornament versus art as essence, uh, virtual reality versus imaginal space, uh, poetry as soul solution, Art journaling is art therapy, nourishing art communities, Zen annihilations, um, which is very interesting to uh, listen to. All of it is, but that one in particular for all artists. Um, then the value of what we choose to lose, which is Zen annihilations, uh, lived experience and grounding, creative inquiry, personal myths, soft spaces for heart truths, archetypal phases of a woman's journey, downloading the imaginal in nature, and all manner of portals. So you should check that episode out uh, for actual dialogue between two humans. This episode is a solo flight, as I mentioned in the intro. It will be only me picking up from last June and the first Lola the Poets solo show um, in which I backflipped into the topic of the shadow, what the concept really entails in story, myth and allegory, its Jungian psychological connotations, personal and collective, and then I turn to the most obvious narrative that bound us together globally in 2020, the pandemic itself, um, riffing on the possibility of infectious narratives, revisiting some theoretical work I've done a long while ago on ways we become hooked on particular stories, especially ones that are strong in archetype. Then I had a total recall of a non-hypnotic regression session I had in my 20s, where I rewound back 
um, in my lizard brain memory to what was an antediluvian time, a place where uh, due to a telepathic uh, accessibility of thought, freedom of thought was impossible, which for me had some resonance with our present planetary circumstances. I finished off with a dystopian dream I had from a decade ago on a transhumanist future uh, where we end up merged with our appliances like uh, toasters, appliances and coffee makers and smartphones and such. Uh, this symbiosis does not work at all, apparently. So if you're interested, check it out too. Just follow the breadcrumbs in various links and platforms. In that episode, I announced two more shows to come on The Shadow, uh, the second one to be more um, on theory and um, the lore and the psychology of The Shadow, um, and the third uh, on the pandemic in full after a year of understanding its impact. Well, I changed my mind on the topics, uh, which is what time and experience does to you. So the year 2020 went uh, for me from being pretty dark collectively um, to being pretty awful personally as I broke my left leg in some river mud and that uh, entire debacle of balance presented me with the futility of sketching out a podcast like this too far into the future or any project for that matter even in terms of a few months or so. Um, this sort of audio art can only live and breathe as it flows and encountering each moment in time as it arrives and merging with its essence and spirit unencumbered with an agenda, much like poetry. Because we cannot really plan to write a poem in the future the way we are able to plan other creative endeavors. It's that immediacy of poetry that makes it uniquely wired uh, to our dream lives. Um, the way we dream is very much the logic of poetry. So, although there is possibly a way to predict a poem, if not plan it, there is also a way to predict a dream. And the avenue of this is always some type of magic, but not of the ritual kind. Uh, the key is in the purity of the intent. Try and tend to have a dream and see what happens. So after I finally recovered after being um, broken, it was already Mercury in Aquarius retro season. That was February, which I mentioned in a promotional blurb at the time that it would be a perfect moment to dive back into the void uh, of time past and retrieve the invisible treasure appropriated by the draconian year of 2020 and retrieve the essentials possibly only the essentials we left behind. Essential being what our souls need most. Mercury Retro has a bad reputation in the press because it's been wrapped badly in the press, uh, mostly by mercurial types who don't go too deep into any topic unless they're compelled to or forced to. Yes, it's a period where you cannot go forward without communication glitches of various kinds, but going backwards is also movement, often quite necessary, a trajectory, if we forgot a key piece of info along our perpetually rushed way. At the same time, there was also a stellium, or rather a full congress of planets in Aquarius, and for those of you who know elements of astrology, or are indeed aces in the art, you're aware that anywhere this planetary saturation fell in your charts in February, and the first half of March, you felt it profoundly. In other words, for each and every one of us, it was about just one key thing your focus ball should have been visible to you, very visible or very tangible, very real. Um, and if you think about what happened within these um, couple of months, very recent months, you might get to possibly understand the workings of your chart and astrology better. You should have also seen the forces that oppose this focus or felt them in, in a very real way and the forces this focus of yours opposed. I'm a Leo rising. Um, it fell into my seventh whole house. 
the house of the other, the public, uh, our one-to-one -one relationships, be they friendly, romantic, or hostile. And the Tarian backlash of Mars and, um, and Uranus also figured in this dance. These two planets were squaring all that business in Aquarius. And if you know your charts, um, see where Aquarius and Taurus are in your whole houses. And that's where the battle lines were drawn. Uh, and this will go on throughout the year because Saturn in Aqua and Uranus in Taurus are staying put in these signs. They're also fixed signs, so they're really staying put. And there will be tension. Tension, I would summarize, between biology and concept. Let's put it that way. Because of this particular positioning of transits in my natal, I got a full dose of the effects of the public realm overflowing into my personal space and challenging my vocational aspirations uh, as my engagement with the public sphere was so consuming, uh, which is really not typical for me. But yeah, I was consumed by what was going on with everyone. And even if I didn't want to be, I would be pulled in. And at the same time, all of this was conducted online, as that is where we are all at now, which brings us neatly to the central theme of this show, the chiaroscuro of social media, shadow patterning of communications. Realm of Mercury, when it, Mercury goes into the underworld. Um, so I thought a lot about uh, Rudolf Steiner's idea of the double, a mechanical demonic copycat other, which shadows our soul the moment we are born according to Steiner, in his very specific anthroposophical take on Christian cosmology. These beings are of a place, geographical location, they're of the earth, and fearing annihilation, they leave bodies when bodies are no more. Uh, this was a direct inheritance of lore from indigenous peoples, uh, particularly the first American nations as that continent in story seems to be conductive to these entities most. For the more daring of my listeners, I recommend finding a few stories on skinwalkers online, but only if they're quality sourced, and by that I mean told by Navajo storytellers and the little they care to disclose to us. Um, these witches, male and female, have doomed themselves to shapeshift after acquiring their magical powers, foregoing the medicine way, and not they're not really doppelgangers of the Steiner typology, but somehow they conjure the idea of a living darkness moving through creatures of Earth and changing hosts more than anything else I heard or can recall. Um, and in that way, they reminded me of the idea of the shadow patterning of communications, the way the shadow travels through people in this concept. This also reminded me of this visceral horror that I always feel when I hear of the Haitian legends of the zombie, a body that once hosted a soul, um, a live body that once hosted a soul, and um, the Jewish legends of the Golem, the father of Frankenstein, a conjured body, matter without soul, but forever seeking it. If Steiner were alive today and saw us able to fully inhabit thin air, um, I wonder if he would have expanded the idea of location when it came to doppelgangers and the solely geographical origins of the double. I believe I saw my double once, um, maybe many times, but once that I can recall. And this was in a dream, and a particular kind of dream, the one that doesn't seem like a dream when we're in it, and also when we're awake after it. Um, and only later I realized how to frame what I encountered in that dream. In it, I was moving through my old neighborhood and only in moments where I would enter and exit mechanical devices like lifts and cars 
would I catch a glimpse of this other me reflecting in the mirrors within these devices. So I wouldn't see my reflection as it was in the age I was when I had the dream, but it was a different me. Um, and it followed me everywhere I went. It was a younger me and it was forever caught at the age of 20. Um, and ideal, determined, beautiful, agile, yet pretty lusterless me with no aim but to shadow with this unattainable dark perfection every faulty and fragile living step I take. So the double was in this um, monstrous being, yet it was demonic and it was caught forever in a point of time. And this uh, reminds me of a piece of myth I heard recently on uh, quite an amazing podcast I, I follow. So I definitely always need to plug it because it really inspires me. It's called Rune Soup. It talks of the shadow, um, or rather Gordon in it talks of the shadow uh, carrying a being's essence in um, ancient Egyptian law. So I'll leave a link to Rune Soup um, in the show notes. I have to remember that. Um, no connection. I'm a premium member of his site, but otherwise no connection. He's just great. It also recalls an old wonder of mine. If David Lynch ever read Steiner before he wrote Twin Peaks. And if you want to read uh, some of my thoughts on this topic, because I've been thinking about this uh, for a while, for a decade or more, I'll leave a link in the show notes to um, the cinema conference paper I presented at City University in New York in 2010, and it was called Archetypal Enchantment and the Twin of David Lynch. Um, Archetypal Enchantment is a theoretical term I coined a year before that, when I was preparing a um, proposal, a PhD proposal on studying the psychological impact of certain cinema narratives, the ways the medium itself can transform us or lead us astray, the medium of film. So that PhD never happened for very strange reasons, but to leave that aside, the manuscript, as they say, is still there and online and did not burn. So um, I'll drop a link on that too, if you're interested. The question that I would like to address most of all is not only what is our online identity, but first of all, to just understand within that context what our identity is, or rather define it for these purposes, and considering all that I said up to now. So talking about the dream I had with me, perfect me in a mechanical device, doubled. I'm just interested if we're haunted by our vision of what our identity is. Um, or are we hunting our identity? Was uh, the double following me everywhere because it needed me? Or was I hanging on to it because I needed it? So can a persona ever represent an identity? Is persona identity? And if so, what age are we when we form this persona? Is it a fluid process? Is it a destination? Is it a perpetual becoming? Is it any sort of palpable reality at all? Can it change day to day? Is it possible for it to change day to day? If we're different every day, what does it do to us if it changed every day? What can it do to us? Also, what is an online identity? Uh, is it a set of criteria, a cluster of markers, a mask we put on every day? Um, that's pun intended, of course. So in order to understand a shadow of something, we must first determine its shape. And only its shape as shadow does not require the elements. It is oblivious to elements. In truth, a shadow is the exact lack of these elements. The form of a subject or an object is its only existential code. No matter its density, the presence or absence of light, it still only follows shape. And to 
possibly better explain, or rather more literally explain, what I am getting at. Observe your hand against the sun in the morning and see if anything other than the outer lines of your hands appear on the walls against your bed. Your shadow is blind to your fingerprints, uh, the lines of your palm, your fingernails, the details of you. The veins that pulse blood into your fingertips also do not figure in the shadow. Everything is hidden and absorbed except the shape of your hand. This is the material of the shadow. It has no matter, no matter that we can define as matter. No cells, no atoms, yet it has a material because we observe it. So it phenomenologically at least exists. It exists and yet it does not have anything within it that we can scientifically prove to be a particle. In Jungian psychology, um, for us to be able to individuate, we must first integrate our shadow. And in this, C.G. Jung was speaking of all the traits we suppress out of shame, fear, loathing, sometimes quite remarkable traits that were dangerous to exhibit because they were mocked and despised by our environment and our families our peers, but not all shadows conceal what is ugly, perverted and deformed, or shunned. Some hide beauty and talent. Some hide our entire family treasure. Some hide all of our true selves. Depends on how large a shadow we carry. How much of us is in the shadows? and our lack of awareness of vastness of us that is undisclosed deepens that shade. In this way, uh, how I feel about the shadow is that it flattens us into a shape. All that bounty and which is both um, goodness and badness and all that is in between uh, disappears in its intricate detail and its um, topography and becomes a space where only contours exist. So the form of something becomes the essence of something. And through that I can see, through that lens, what the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, um, were referring to. Now back to our online cells. Even before the pandemic, a um, hefty chunk of our lives has been conducted in our out-of-body experience on screen, be the screen large or small. And in the year 2020, the balance of us has been tipped towards the virtual. Some sort of line in the sand, or rather Rubicon, has been crossed. I will now read to you a chapter from an art manifesto I wrote in 2008. It was a letter from myself to my future self um, to guide me whenever I would forget where I'm going or become lost artistically or as a human. And it was written about the time social media was emerging as a force in our lives, but um, was still in its youth, if not its infancy. It has to do with the difference I perceived then, uh, which was important to me, between dreamers and visionaries and living in virtual reality versus living in reality, where this might lead to if unchecked. What is most curious about this text to me is not so much what it got right, but how recent a past it was written in. And it seems to carry an entire century in between the time I wrote it and now. So much condensed within has happened. And this acceleration trajectory of our species is astounding, spurred by the very nature of capitalism for sure, but also by inner anxious frenzy, a state of existential unease caused, I think, by never grounding ourselves in the moment we're in. Because if we're to exist, therefore, in our minds, 
we must catch the next moment and the next moment and become and become and become until we catch that golden identity of us that we can fix in the air and then relax knowing that we have become immortal in the matrix until the matrix is no more anyway um, this is the paragraph uh, visionaries reveal to us uncomfortable truths they make us question our beliefs they touch on our vulnerability by unmasking theirs, making us fragile in our humanity and humble or irritate us by their determination. Dreamers move in circles. Visionaries ride on a spiral without end. The difference between a spiral and a circle is movement. This entwined ride is the DNA of Mother Earth and of our species. In our world addicted to prettiness, the wildest beauty of truth and the truth of beauty has been deceptively presented as a professionally designed, perfectly palatable image. This weaving of the Maya is, is building a parallel illusionary universe founded on a billion little lies. And one day we might all collectively cross into that world unaware that we are losing the one thing that makes us souls our capacity for empathy for to empathize truly with the other we must be aware of the truth in our lives as well as the truth in theirs and be willing to forgive especially ourselves performed spirituality so often becomes a status marker a fashion statement not our state of soul. We are rapidly becoming mere headline readers in all matters of life, distracted or merely lazy to turn the other page and question the soundbite device to form us and not to inform us. And yet we are taking it in like sugar. It gives us a high of invincibility, this stream of ceaseless around-the-clock information. Valid or not, it removes us further away from our intuition, our bodies, and our sensations, unplugging us from our individual systems and into narratives that are simplified to entertain or weaponized to deceive. If you'd like to read this in full, it's on the poetry page on my uh, Poets, Mavericks and Prophets blog. When we speak of the meta narratives, the archons in Gnostic law, um, we must always be aware that they are by their nature mechanical. They are man-made. These are not cosmic stories surviving throughout millennia through cultivation and dedication, respect, weaving their way through history by a sacred power of awe. No, these meta-narratives we feed on are copies of sacred tales developed to capture attention and create a power grid for the purpose of becoming engines of the way a society is to develop. Thus, inevitably, growing to monstrous proportions through the routine mechanism of systems and institutions which run on these narratives, derive power from the way these narratives affect us. Now, this could indeed happen without any consciousness of thought, as it is debatable if a consciousness within a machine can overrun its determined need for utility, to which it always autocorrects itself. What I'm saying is that it is in a way immaterial if the stories which were fed by media machines, as media is now the main way we communicate. We communicate individually through mass communication. So it is immaterial whether these machines are set to enslave us or they're just a product of a mechanical mind, an archonic mind, a machine mind, driven by software but limited by its hardware and thus merely reproducing itself in order to survive creating distractions and attractions and disasters and decoys to protect its very simple core mission, which is merely its own survival. The important thing, I think, is why we're addicted to the machine, not the fact that this mechanism in one way or another exists. 
Similarly, like our shadow exists because it is very easy to perceive it, yet we cannot say it has a materiality to it in a way that we understand materiality. Claiming these systems of power do not exist and are not shaping human destiny is equal to denying the existence of the shadow because we cannot dilute its entirety into particles of a known quantity and quality. This would be the same as declaring that the existence of a shadow is a folly in itself because we cannot determine its full nature within our existing scientific frameworks. But pondering on the mystery of this predicament, I think might take us further away from what we can do about it. And the key again is always in our conscious intent. The same can be transposed to the existence of dreams. We know the neurology behind dreaming, but what is the material of dreams? Is it electricity? And come to think of it, what is the material of thoughts? Also electricity? And all our machines work on electricity. So the fun thing about thinking is that it always requires a conclusion, but thankfully it does not always reach it. So dreams have no material, yet they have a materia. There is a palpability to them just as much as there is a palpability to an apple I'm about to eat and the couch I'm sitting on and the microphone I'm talking into. In that sense, there is a palpability to our interactions in the virtual world just as much as there is in real life. But what kind of a world are we encountering behind this looking glass? I'm increasingly interested in the idea of mirror matter, uh, shadow matter or Alice matter, an actual hypothetical counterpart to ordinary matter in physics. Nevertheless, in psychology, which is my primary field, we still do not fully understand the materiality of our psychic systems. Although we are advanced in its concepts and in the prediction of its unfolding and its functionality. So when we are online talking behind our avatars and profiles and handles, is that us talking or is it the mirror us, the double, the mechanical shadow doppelganger, one that reveals the contours of a human but not our topographies and our presence, our breath and our flesh? And about whom we only know what it does not obstruct from view, like the shadow being it is. Because the only thing we can say about a shadow still is that it's non-light. This perfect identity we chase through the mirror world to replace our own flawed, aging, mortal being is what we give to the darkness, therefore. The non-world, the void, in order to gain a sliver of immortality. Similarly, this is what we can say about stories. We are drawn to them because they offer a context to us, which is better than nothingness. And we all do this willingly, yet mostly unwittingly in a game set to reduce us to data, which will reveal everything about us there is to know, but to a machine, never to another human being. The arconic data is thus inherently flawed. So, dear poets, here's to us until the next show in May. And in the not too distant future, the third installment of In the Shadow solo series. Stay in the sacred, especially if you're walking through the dark. And good luck.